I'll try to do two things today, to be the first speaker to be finished on time, and second, to, <laughs> to uh, inspire you to become a doer rather than a planner. Um, so I'm JP, but I want to know who you are. Uh, how many of you can do things, like code computer to do something, or build a machine that actually do something? Okay, so I have to try to inspire more of you to become doers, because that's really important. Um, but you're still young, so there's really no excuse. Um, these are a bunch of slides that I found in different presentations that were made to me in different functions of my, times, uh, of my life about how to make innovation, because I was always considered the one that could see the future, although I don't, I really don't, but I can do stuff. But then you would see these processes to innovate, right? So this, this is really important. I don't, know, I don't know if this thing has a laser pointer, but the interesting thing is that, I'll try to read it for you, you know, you have communicate the plan, review, uh, add insights to the teams, like build a business plan. There is no place in there where people are doing things. Right? I can guarantee you that this does not work. If you do something that no one has done before, you will be more informed by doing than by actually trying to carefully select the right color ball and put it in the right place uh, on the right chart. Interestingly enough, you can go on and on, and all of these things are probably on the internet, you will find, again, they forgot the doing part. <laughs> it's amazing. <laughs> and you look at this one, again, there's a product tester, but there's not actually a product maker. <laughs> Very interesting. And you find them all in all. Even there, they have implementation, which should be doing, but it's identify solution, align resources, build commercial plan, financial feasibility. It's not been built yet. <laughs> right? So I want to talk to you a little bit about this, but this doesn't apply if, if you ever run an airport tower or a hospital or something, just forget everything I said. It, it, it's only about doing new things, like things that people have never done before, right? Don't, don't run an airport that way. Uh, you know, planning is consistently killing doing. So I will talk a little bit more and we can ask, uh, you can ask me any questions you like afterwards. But I've seen consistent examples of big companies killing doing by planning, right? Yet at the end of the day, doing will always eat planning lunch. So you'll have a competitor that actually does the stuff that you were trying to plan, and it will eat your lunch, right? So you have to choose who you want to be on what side you want to be. Uh, and we need to dig deeper a little bit into the meaning of planning and the meaning of doing. Uh, there's a micro consideration going, uh, you know, no pain, no gain, no risk, no gain. There's really something that has changed in the last decade which is that it's very, very, very difficult to make money without taking risk. There used to be a time where you could be protected by something. You're protected by geography. You could do your own French car company because you knew the Italian car companies would not come and attack you. You would take the license of a carburetor and you could do it in Czech Republic and you would be protected by all kinds of laws and frontiers and, and borders, etc. You're not anymore. So if you don't take risk, it's like taking all the money going to the, to the savings bank and asking them to give you money, and they will give you something that turns out to be negative in the long run. Uh, there is no way to do it without taking risk. But planning, if you want, is a form of risk reduction, right? It, it's, that's what people do. So if you reduce risk, it's very easy to reduce the actual gain that you have from the risk. Um, so why do people plan? You know, many bad reasons, like they reduce risk, but mostly personal risk. Like they fear to fail. They fear to be the one that says, oh, I'm going to get this done and then fail. Right? That's the basic reason why big companies actually plan a lot about the what they want to do. It very rarely makes things cheaper. You'd be very surprised that uh, in, in many forms, the more you plan, the more things become expensive. Um, because if you don't plan, well, you're going to hire the right person, but you're going, not going to find that many of them, and so it's better. But if you make a plan, you're going to need oh, 18 people to do this, and you're going to have a department that hires 18 people, if they, even if they're not able to do it. Uh, and it's mostly about covering your ass, because the plan needs to get approved. So it's like a budget, right? You get the stamp, and then at the end it fails, and you say, yeah, but we all discussed it, and you know, we were all agreeing on this, and so no one really failed, and you know, we're all good, and... Yeah, who could have known that Facebook was going to eat the world? Uh, you know, there's one good reason, is that you should plan to make sure that you reach sub some, something uh, substantial. So you should always have a perfect vision of what would be the ultimate goal that you want to achieve, not necessarily the achievable goal, the achievable goal, but what you really, really want to, uh, to achieve. So who, who do you want to be? You want to be the guy or the girl who asks when and how much? 
right? So they, there's a lot of people in big companies that come to you and say, when will it be finished and how much will it cost? Not what will you do? That's a totally somewhat irrelevant question or not interesting. You know, everyone hates that guy, but mostly behind their backs, right? Because they're the boss usually, so it's, it's a bit. Or do you want the, the, guy, the guy or the girl who cares more and commits about the what, says, I'm going to get this done. I have a little trick. It's called the Varshall First Law of Hackering. Uh, so you make your best, get best, best uh, guess. You say, well, it's going to take me a week, right? You multiply it by two, and you move one unit. So it's two weeks, one month, uh, two months, right? Uh, because you never get it done at the right time. So whenever you have to make a, an estimate to these guys, you double it and then move one unit, because it's going to take you that time, most likely. Right? You, so I spent the first part of my life, I think, just saying, ah, oh, no problem, be done in two days. And then, uh, <laughs> yeah, so, so, you know, it's, it's useful to have this and this. Uh, also, you should see planning as a form of insurance. No, you should not see it, uh, uh, you know, you should see planning as a form of a guarantee that good things can happen rather than a, a, a form of insurance that bad things cannot possibly happen. And most often, you will find that people try to guarantee that bad things do not happen. But that's almost a guarantee that good things will never happen because you didn't even define what a good thing is. Right? You don't try to take over the world, you're not going to take over the world by not trying, it's not going to happen or by trying to avoid not to fail doing it. Um, I'll give you a few examples. I don't know how many people use Slack. I try to be kind of modern. Yeah, yeah no, not really. Well, Slack was founded as a gaming company uh, and totally failed, right? But the Slack was the tool that they used to communicate between themselves when they were failing during the game. Uh, that, I think, is worth a few billion now. Uh, again, you cannot plan these things, right? Uh, it was in the back of their head. It was very useful. They made it because they were doing stuff. Like, they built their own tools. They didn't just take something off the, the shelf and, and, and use it. They actually built it because they thought it would solve a problem. Then it turns out that the game they were building did not solve any problems in the world, but their tool did, and, and that kind of worked out. Same investor, by the way, so at least they had a good US investor that could uh, refrain from taking the money back and allow them to co pursue a completely different idea than what they started with. Uh, Twitter was started as a podcast company, uh, and Twitter, again, was a, uh, a little piece of software that they had written in one weekend to try to make it uh, more easy for them to communicate. I saw the code of Twitter in, in when they wrote it. It really looked like it had been written over a weekend. Uh, it, it was, you know, it was nothing, right? Um, but it gets bigger, you know. Google uh, was founded as a as a company that would provide search technologies to portals um, because portals were not that great at it, right? And they actually failed doing that because once you do a search engine and they are demonstrably, you know, there's a way to measure the quality of search engine and they are demonstrably 10% better quality than every other search engine out there. And so they thought that's a great idea, that's a good business, a good plan, we're going to go to all the portals in the world and we're going to sell them the all search technology, which is demonstrably 10% better than theirs, and there's got to be someone who's going to buy this. Well, it turns out not really, because portals at that time thought that the only way they could make money was by retaining people, so being 10% better means 10% better at sending people away, and that makes it sort of 10% worse. So they failed, they didn't find any customer until they were convinced by their, uh, by their advisor to quit their PhD and try to make a go at making a company out of it. Right? So this is kind of forgotten. I don't know if many of you knew that, but it's actually the truth, right? Uh, Microsoft kind of, well, sorry, jump a little bit. Oh, yeah. Microsoft kind of, <laughs> you know, didn't start out as trying to be the worst company in the world, trying to take over the whole software world. They, they, they were making tools for developers to actually write software. They were making languages. Right? Uh, until basically they got almost virtually forced to try to provide an operating system to IBM because the other guy decided to flew his plane instead of going to the meeting. Uh, and they quickly tried to scramble something together to put it in. But once you're in there something and you're doing something, you start to learn how it works and you see where you can go and then you keep going and then eventually you get there. But it wasn't exactly planned. Uh, the same with Amazon AVS. It was not this is actually more interesting because it was forbidden to plan. So uh, in, uh, when Werner Vogel started to implement this to, as a better way for employees to, um, 
to utilize technology. So in big company, basically what you have uh, is hoarding. So especially in, in uh, commerce companies around Christmas time, because you're so afraid to miss the Christmas season, you order as much hardware as possible in July uh, so that you know that your servers will run. This is describing a little bit of world of 15 years ago, but you order as many servers as you like, as you can get your hands on, just to make sure you, again, because of planning, you don't run out of server in the middle of the season. You rather have too many. But you never give them away. You never give them back. That's a rule because you look stupid when you give resources back in a big company. And Werner started to create a system that would allow you to take resources and give them back and then retake them five minutes later without looking like an idiot. Uh, Jeff Bezos liked it and uh, the team was bizarrely in South Africa doing this. No one really knows why, but they were. Uh, and he refused to see a business plan about this unit for three years. He refused absolutely that people would even plan about what this could be. Because the planning itself would have reduced the ultimate size. Because you would plan for what you could imagine, not for plan for what the, the system would actually turn out to be. And this is, by all means, this is a huge business. This is probably uh, a five billion type a revenue business that's replacing a 50 billion type business that is dying uh, behind it. Uh, so, so this is by all means absolutely super and this was actually forbidden to be planned. Like you can probably find this in books somewhere that Jeff Bezos actually forbid anyone to write an Excel sheet with numbers on it. Um, so how do you plan, right? You, I'm not advocating that you don't plan but you don't plan to cover your ass. Right? If, if, if you go to a VC because you all want to be an entrepreneur, I guess, if CDTM, and they ask you for a business plan, well, you do it because you have to, right? Don't, but don't start believing it, <laughs> right? And, and do it because you start, because it's good to reflect about certain things, right? But don't believe in it and don't implement the plan because you will first implement the cost side, uh, and that's easy to do, uh, roughly, and, and then you, you will forget the other side, right? So, so Plan the next huge hurdle. Don't plan it away, right? Don't remove the hurdle in your plan because it looks really hard. Just attack it head, head front, right? We mentioned PayPal earlier with Elon Musk. PayPal actually succeeded because they tackled the most difficult problem in the financing industry, which was fraud. So Max Lefshin, which is another, uh, well, he's a board member at Facebook and a generally rich guy, actually tackled the problem and said, let me fix the fraud problem. Because if we don't fix the fraud problems with software, we're going to be dead. But if we fix it, we're going to be super rich. And all the banks looked at it and said, no one's going to fix that because that's too hard. Right? So of course, obviously, they didn't plan to fix it. Like he said, oh, I'm going to take two months and three days and it cost, cost me $23. He actually started to actually try to fix it and eventually learn things that other people had overseen. Uh, you know, disturb reality, don't accept it as an excuse. I mean, plans are usually built around reality. Like, it's not good form to write a plan that presupposes that reality and physics do not, do not tick the way they do. Uh, but when you're trying to plan your next step, especially in digital, please do not accept reality as it is, right? The, the, mobile, in, the mobile world that we see today is only eight years old. That's a baby, right? Uh, it, it's like planning, like, oh, well, it's so bad because iOS and Android, you know, they're taking over the world. Like, it's like saying 99 that, oh, you know, it's too late, Microsoft has it, you know. <laughs> it's done, right? Explorer, forget it. Like, there's no place for browser or anything. So, so don't, <laughs> don't take the world for granted, right? Just don't. Uh, and, and, but the problem is if you start planning, you know, it's hard to go to someone else and say, look, I, I believe that all of what you see is bullshit. It's hard, and so don't try to do it. Um, make sure you're building, not just project. I think it's extremely important to, to it's like investing, like you want to keep the assets. You, you want to keep building upon other things. People tend to move through life in project. Like they do something for three months, it doesn't work, they throw it away. They do something for another three months, it doesn't. Try to build up, like keep some people with you, just bring the team along. Uh, you know, there's some old technologies that we recycle into massive products. I mean, one of the clicks fail product is actually the most successful product at Zinc today with the newsletter. Right? You can recycle stuff because you've learned something that you've seen and of course it didn't work out that you planned, but it works out for someone else. And plan by doing instead of, you know, pl pl do after planning. Because every time you tackle a problem, you will see that it's a little bit easier, or a little bit different, or a little bit something's going to show up that's going to give you a sense of where you should go next. How do you do it? Uh, how do you do? So beware of the Dunning-Kruger effect, which is almost a joke if you read it, but it's actually fun. Uh, it's, 
it's this very strange phenomenon that people who have no idea about something tend to overestimate their ability to fix it. People who have a lot of idea about something tend to underestimate, tend to overestimate the ability of others to copy it, both of which are false, right? If you're an idiot and you cannot do something and then you try to do something, you will fall down. If you're an expert and you believe that everyone will copy you, most likely they won't because most people are not actually as good as you. Uh, and this, the, 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 the funny part of the effect is that as soon as people who have no competence do a few steps to gain competence, they become very depressed. Because suddenly they look over the wall and say, oh shit, <laughs> this is much harder than I expected. And the ability to overcome this effect is very important in life. Right? It, it's very important for you to overcome this, like looking over and say, oh <laughs> God, this is scary. You know, <laughs> there, there are other people out there and they're really doing things that I don't understand. And I'd rather be in my little world where everything is nice and I'm the expert. Right? Um, quantity always trumps qu uh, quality. There's this little, uh, we're not sure if it's true or not, but uh, there was a, apparently a pottery professor in university that was in fact a psychology professor, not really a pottery professor. And he divided this class into two halves. And he said one half will be graded by the quantity of pots that they produce over the year. So if you make 40 kilos of pots, you will get a B. And if you have 80 kilos, you will make an A. And the other part of the class was told that they would be rated on quality. So you, you show your best pot, they will be experts, and they will just give you a grade based on the quality of your pot. Uh, the story goes that the quantity uh, part of the class just won on quality. Because if you make a lot of pots, eventually it's going to get boring, and you're going to start making some really good pots because you just made so many of them and you learn how to do it. If you shoot for perfection, most likely you will, yeah. You will make your best pot, but since you haven't made that many, it doesn't really matter. Right? And, and so keep, keep doing things because they will automatically become better. It's very difficult for humans to keep doing stupid things. Um, learn by doing, never by learning. So, so if you, it's a little bit like you're in, in, in student. Like, do you learn more by doing homework? Do you learn more by reading about how to build a web server than rather than write one? Uh, no, you don't. No one does. Right? So, so learn by doing, never, never by learning. Uh, and so, endly, uh, finally, make things or code and not PowerPoint and Excel sheets. And we are hiring always. <laughs> and I'm almost on time, 17 minutes. I'm so sorry. Uh, <laughs>